Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey there, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for today's session. It is 5.30 a.m. here in Pacific Beach, um, San Diego. And uh, I'm very pleased to have you all joining us from all around the world. We've got a, a bank holiday happening in uh, the UK. So thank you to all those people that are giving up a little bit of your time on the bank holiday um, to join us. Um, and uh, for all of you getting up very early in the, uh, in the uh, Pacific time zone and for everyone all across the world who are looking forward to a fantastic session today. We really have got a great session planned. Um, before I do anything, as always, can I just ask that you raise your hand to let me know that you can hear me loud and clear? Okie doke. Thank you very much for that. I can see your hands up. Brilliant. I'm now going to put all your hands back down again, just so um, you can do that. Just to let you know, um, throughout the session, feel, please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, that's no problem at all. There's two ways you can ask questions. Um, number one is on our Facebook page. Um, you can find that facebook.com slash W-B-E-C-S. Um, that's World Business Executive Coach Summit. Um, you can just answer the, them on the wall. That's facebook.com slash W-B-E-C-S. If you haven't joined us as a friend or as a, a like on there, please do. Uh, there's lots of awesomeness we share on there. I think one of the, the last few posts has been a, a, a link to some great resources from Marshall Goldsmith. And um, we don't really just do, do anything on there other than lots of awesomeness. So please do jump on there. Um, just some other um, housekeeping. Um, the recording is being made of today's session. And um, we will be making it available to everybody in the, the members area and for those who buy a ticket. Um, as you may have seen in the email that I sent, each week I'm going to pick one of the sessions to release to everybody, um, just so you've got something to to enjoy over the weekend. Um, I'm not sure what that session will be this year, but uh, or this week, but uh, keep an eye out for that. Anyway, without further ado, let's move on to our session. Um, today we have a very awesome session. Um, now, just to give you some background. Um, I have a client I worked with for many years, um, a lady called Natalie Ashdown. And Natalie is an absolute rock star. She works very closely with some of the, the world's leading experts. And she very, very, very rarely recommends um, people to me. In fact, she's only ever recommended two uh, people to me. Um, uh, one was our presenters today, Marvin and Grant, and the other was Sir John Whitmore. Um, and, she, we, you know, we worked so closely together um, that, um, you know, we have a very, very strong relationship and, and I take anything that Nally says as absolute gold. Um, and she says, Ben, you know, really, you do need to, to have these people um, presenting this year at WBX. So we did some investigations and some snooping around and looked into them, spoke to some people that they'd worked with and, and learned from them. And we were blown away by um, some of the things that they're working on and thought, yes, we really have to have them on board this year. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, um, Marvin Oka. Um, is that how I pronounce it? Marvin, is that right? Yeah, well done, Ben. Yes, thanks a lot. Cool. Um, it's 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 it's, uh, it's great to have you on board here. Um, Marvin's recognised um, as a world leader and authority in the field of behavioural modelling, modelling, and behavioural change technologies. Um, he's an international consultant and speaker with corporate and government clients throughout Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia, North America, Europe, and the Middle East. Um, he works in the areas of ex executive leadership team development leadership communications, strategic and systemic thinking, and organizational culture shaping. Our sec second presenter, Grant, um, is Grant Suzula, Suzulu? Suzulu, Suzulu. Suzulu. Suzulu, there we go. Grant Suzulu holds multiple academic qualifications combined with wide-ranging expertise and experience in both the educational and business sectors. He has published articles and papers in international journals in the fields of applied physics and philosophy. He is the author of the book, Total Quality Meetings, um, which was published by La Trobe University Press. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce both of these awesome gentlemen to our stage. So I'll pass over to you. Over to you, gentlemen. Great, thank you, Ben, and welcome, everyone. It's a great, great honor to be here and speaking with you all today. 
Um, so we'd like to introduce you to a fabulous thing that we've been working on over the last couple of years that we call MBIT, which stands for Multiple Brain Integration Techniques. And it's very exciting. And one of the things that we found, and we've got so much to cover in such a short span of time, so uh, pardon us if we go along at a re relatively quick clip, but uh, we've got a lot we want to uh, share with you. Uh, one of the things that we're finding is that neuroscience, the neuro latest neuroscience findings, is beginning to prove what ancient wisdom traditions have been saying for two and a half to three and a half thousand years. When we look at the various wisdom traditions that are out there, uh, they will speak often of the need for human compassion or being able to follow the wisdom of the heart or to having some degree of integration within the neurology of the human being. And they speak of it in many different terms. And in some ways, in modern day, we might think of things of, think of phrases such as, uh, listen to the wisdom of your heart or you know, to be able to check in with your inner knowing or your inner wisdom. We might consider that to simply be uh, lovely phrases uh, for things that seem to be at some level possibly at one level common sense but at other levels perhaps just simply uh, good advice but where's the hard science behind it and we're starting to find that neuroscience today is actually putting the hard science behind it that there actually are such things as wisdom of the heart and a wisdom of the gut and we hear it in people's language today when people speak of things such as uh, when they need to have some a heartfelt connection with someone or they have a heart to heart or they trust their gut instinct. What do these kinds of phrases actually mean? And what do they actually refer to? And neuroscience is showing that we actually have three functioning brains. Not just in the head, or what's known as the cephalic brain, but also we have a heart brain. The heart is a bona fide brain. It's what's called the cardiac brain, and, it, and so is the gut. The gut is what's called the enteric brain. Uh, each is a complex adaptive neural network. Each has neurotransmitters. Each can be able to process information, can store memory, can has, has neuroplasticity. Uh, each is a thinking, learning organism. And without going into too much of the great uh, science details at this point in time, what is astounding is that, A, first of all, we have more than just one brain, more than just one in the head. We have three brains, or at least what science can prove at this point in time, in the head, heart, and gut. And that each of these brains do different things. Now, interestingly, before we get into what they ex exactly do and how the significance of these findings are profound for professional coaches, uh, because what it means is uh, when, when clients come to you today, um, often what you're going to find is a lot of their challenges seems to be a breakdown of communication or integration between the wisdom of each of these brains. Because they do different things, it's easy for people to then experience, as we all commonly have, conflicts between the head, the heart, and the gut. The head wants to do one thing, the heart is saying another, the gut is saying something else. Well, how do we resolve all of these? And without understanding the languages of each of these different neural networks, then it becomes very difficult to actually work with them. But once you do, once you do understand exactly what these different neural networks do, well, how their functions are different, and how they can work together for the optimum integration of the whole person, then a lot of people's challenges seem to be able to not only get resolved, but a lot of their life issues get dissolved because a new form of consciousness starts to emerge when these three brains are integrated. And we'll explain a lot more of what these mean over time. Uh, but before we go a lot farther, I might just hand over to Grant for a moment. Uh, and particularly if Grant, uh, you might just quickly explain a bit of the history of how the enteric brain and the cardiac brain has come into, into modern day parlance in the science world. Yes, thank you, Marvin. Uh, it's really quite fascinating, especially in terms of the enteric brain, um, not the gut brain, in that uh, neuroscience only discovered that we have a, you know, a complex adaptive neural network with approximately 500 million neurons in the gut region uh, around about 15 to 20 years ago with the work of Professor Michael Gershon. Uh, he wrote a very seminal book called The Second Brain, uh, where he argued that this complex adaptive network, neural network in the gut was uh, functional brain had all of the equivalents componentry of a brain. Uh, fascinatingly though, when I, Marvin and I started to do the research on the enteric brain and what its competencies might be, I started to research in the literature going back. It turns out that uh, Western medicine, allopathic medicine, actually discovered the enteric brain uh, around about well over a hundred years ago. It was 1895 and I have a, a medical anatomy textbook that actually describes the enteric brain that they'd found a very complex neural network there. So it got lost in the annals of science and has been rediscovered uh, in more recent times 
and of course the cardiac brain equally there's been a lot of research over the last 15 to 20 years um, more particularly in the last decade with the work of organizations like the HeartMath Institute and they found that uh, there's some very specific competencies and intelligences that occur in the cardiac brain and there's now a field of neurocardiology each of these brains are quite profound in their own right. They do different things, they have different intelligences, and as a result, we use different terms for them at different times. So we might call these three brains at times. We might also call them three intelligences. Sometimes we'll call them three neural networks. Uh, we'll use those terms interchangeably. So if you hear Grant and I swapping between these terms, uh, we're still referring to the head, heart, and the gut complex adaptive neural networks. Now we also, perhaps before we get a lot farther, is explain a bit of our terminology here, the kinds of phrases that we use. Uh, and you would have seen on our opening slide, you would have seen two different words, embraining and ambit. And embraining is a verb, which we basically we made up the word. Uh, it's a verb form of the word brain. It's the way that you're doing your multiple braining. The M stands for multiple. Uh, we deliberately chose the word multiple rather than three brain or three uh, brain, three brain integration techniques because we started with what science can prove at this point in time and we then use that to inform a lot of action research and behavioral modeling research to see how the science plays out in human day, uh, everyday life uh, and so we call it multiple brains rather than three brains because we know sometime in the future that science will probably find more complex adaptive neural networks in our neurology uh, there's probably more brains that's the that we have available. It's just that science hasn't been able to prove it yet. Uh, we've got a lot of evidence to suggest certain kinds of brains that are probably there, uh, but we're waiting for the science to actually catch up and prove it before we incorporate it into our approach. Uh, but the first term, coming back to definition of terms, we're saying embraining. The, it's the verb form of the way you're using your multiple brains. So if you've got a coaching client and they come up to you and they're saying, I don't know what to do. I'm having some trouble with my career or in my life or whatever it might be. My head is saying one thing. Uh, my heart really wants to do something else, but my gut is afraid and doesn't really want to do it. Uh, we're seeing that the way that they do their embraining process, their multiple braining processes to create essentially what is their challenge situation or their challenge state. Uh, but at the same time, we also use the term in, in a way that aligns the brain. So we say that they might need to do some embraining processes so that their multiple brains get aligned and get integrated so that they are internally congruent with their decisions and actions. Uh, for that, how do you do that? We reach for a range of techniques, what we call multiple brain integration techniques, or AMBIT. And it's the whole suite of practical techniques that Grant and I have developed that allows people to get in contact with their three brains, listen to those intuitive signals, align those three brains and harness the intelligence of all of them when they're working together. And we'll explain a bit uh, coming up a bit later in this uh, session uh, what happens uh, when those three brains do get aligned. Something quite remarkable starts to occur for the human being. Now, th where we developed this didn't come out of the clear blue sky. It wasn't just uh, Grant and I just sitting in the back room thinking about these things. There were a range of things that uh, we pulled on and a range of things that we did also to start to produce a lot of this uh, approach and, the, and this methodology. Uh, so again, I might hand over to Grant to give a quick overview as to um, the, how we came about developing multiple brain integration techniques. Thanks, Marvin. So uh, basically what we wanted to do was uh, ensure that we were using all of the neuroscience findings and the evidence from psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, cognitive linguistics, all of the available uh, scientific evidence to inform the sorts of action research and behavioral modeling we're doing. So we pulled on um, pathology and disease evidence, for example, what happens if uh, in the gut region there is a specific disease or um, some sort of surgical uh, intervention, for example, gastric banding. So there is research that has been done on people who have had gastric banding and the sorts of personality changes that occur after gastric banding and that occur very quickly uh, even before any weight loss has occurred. So it's uh, not necessarily anything to do with the fact that somebody has um, actually lost body mass or lost weight. Uh, it's, it's something that's occurring due to a constriction that the enteric brain has detected and that causes certain sorts of changes in personality. And so by using this range of evidence, everything from evolutionary and phylogenetic evidence, embryological development evidence, uh, and uh, going back from a behavioral modeling perspective to ancient wisdom evidence, we looked for common factors across these divergent sources. And when we, after we did a common factor analysis, we were able to determine what were the prime functions and the core competencies 
that each of these neural networks, the heart, the gut and the head, were involved in some way of control or expression of these sorts of competencies and therefore were leverage points. And from that we were then able to do our behavioural modelling, do action research to validate this in the field, in the fields of coaching and fields of leadership. And we pull from everywhere, as Grant has just mentioned, all the way from ancient wisdom, uh, literature, all, all the way to modern day science. And if even if you look at today in the uh, what we know today from ancient wisdom traditions, uh, it's quite fascinating to find that numerous comparative studies show that it is more the norm than it is the exception for most spiritual and religious practices to have a reference to three souls or three forms of intelligence, which is very fascinating. Uh, there might be listeners uh, listening today that are very familiar with various approaches such as the Enneagram or Taoist practices, Taoist breathing practices, or the three major arms of yoga, for instance. Uh, and again, all spiritual traditions all have a reference to three souls, which is quite fascinating. Now, what are they referring to? What is it about these three souls or three forms of innate intelligence that's being tapped into? And again, when we balance what we see there, combined with what we're seeing in modern science, what neuroscience is showing when we take a look at behavioral modeling and take a look at what people actually do in their, in their language patterns and the way that they work with their, with their body in terms of dealing with practical everyday situations. And as Grant has mentioned, when we look at functional disorders, the neurophysiology of functional disorders, we start to see common patterns start to emerge. And again, it's, uh, we can spend a lot of time explaining what we're about to explain, which is what's called the prime functions, but we'll cut to the chase uh, in this particular uh, pre-summit webinar. Uh, we find that each of these three different neural networks, these three brains, do different things. They have different forms of intelligences or different competencies, different skill sets, different abilities that they are particularly good at. The head brain should come as no surprise for most people. The three things that the head brain are particularly good at is co our cognitive perception, thinking processes ranging from problem solving, analysis, synthesis, whatever it might be, and fine art of making meaning, which is coming up with storyline, putting language to things, uh, creating narrative to things. The head brain is particularly good at those three dominant functions. The heart, the heart is particularly good at emoting processes. Our emotional, our emotional processing comes into play through the heart. You'll notice, for instance, when many people refer to deep-seated emotions, where are their gestures? Where do they refer to? What are the language patterns that are often been used for that? And often it will be in references to the heart intelligence, where people wear their sleeves on the heart. When we say someone wears their sleeve, wears, where, sorry, wears, no, wears their heart on their sleeve, sorry. When we say when someone wears their heart on their sleeve, we don't mean that their thinking and their logic is crystal clear. We mean that it's very easy to, to notice what they're feeling because the emoting processes relate to, to a lot of references to the heart. As do values. Our core values, whenever people reference what's, what's important to them, or what's deeply important to them, what's close to them, they start gesturing towards their heart area. And how people feel about each other, their relational affect, is often referenced via the heart intelligence, where we have heartfelt connections with people. Or people is or when people are warm-hearted, uh, obviously, they have they have very kind kindly uh, relations with people. So it's interesting enough. Uh, we did several keynotes uh, over the last year or so, and when we, we might often find people who are very familiar with the neuroscience uh, work that's available today, particularly around neuroscience of leadership, neuroscience of peak performance, and often there will be a lot of references to the limbic system in the head brain. Um, saying that the limbic system is where a lot of the emotional processing occurs. And it can certainly look that way if you're only looking at the head. Uh, what's interesting, though, is in behavioral modeling research, if you have to look at what people are actually referencing, uh, when people start to reference things like deep-seated emotions or core values or how they really feel about someone, uh, they almost never, in fact, never, do they ever point or gesture towards the limbic system in their head. They almost always are referencing some aspect towards their chest area or to their heart area. And we start to notice, well, why is that? What is, the, what is the unconscious intuitive gesture towards that heart area? Because that is where the dominant set of sensations and signals are occurring. The gut, and again, we could spend the next 20 minutes just talking about this next set of prime functions and how they've come to be, but the gut is particularly interesting. The gut brain is responsible for your core identity. It's responsible for really maintaining your, your deepest sense of who you are. This is when people can resonate with things deep in their gut, or they feel something deep in their gut. Uh, it's also responsible for protection, safety, self-preservation. 
A lot of your boundary issues, a lot of safety, fear, protection issues, you get processed via the gut. Most people, when they feel fear, the first place they're going to start feeling it is going to be anxiety or butterflies in the stomach, something in the gut. When people are very afraid, their stomach starts to tremble, and they might get anything from throwing up to constipation to diarrhea. But a lot of a gut reaction starts to occur. And you heard in people's language again. People talk about their gut instinct or gut reaction or what's their gut feel for something. And often it's, re it's related to either something having to do with their core identity, having something to do with fear or protection, or it has to do with mobilization, the need to act. And again, we hear it in people's language. When people say you know, the, the person doesn't have the guts, it means they don't have the courage to act via, via that intelligence, using that intelligence. When someone doesn't have the guts to do something, they don't have the courage to act in the face of fear. And so again, your capacity to, to, to mobilize yourself, to actually get, go into action, has much to do with processing in the gut intelligence. Now, these are very significant. First of all, just understanding that each of these different intelligences have these different prime functions or do these different prime functions is quite important. So again, in a coaching situation, if a client comes to you and they are saying that they are having challenges between a uh, decision they've got to make and their head says, well, logic says this and they shouldn't do this because of whatever reasons, whatever making of meaning they've come up with, but their heart, their emotional va emotions and values are coming into play. Their heart says, but they want to do it. But their gut goes into a fear mode, bec usually because of the head processing, and the gut says, well, I don't know if we should do that because you know, it might jeopardize our, our income or might, you know, what if things go wrong. Uh, and again, the, the gut goes into that reaction. So how do we handle it? As a professional coach, how do you work with a client at this point in time? Obviously, it's not going to work if you try to do everything through the head. If we said, well, great, let's try and analyze everything and let's, let's do, a, uh, let's do a, a pros and cons on a sheet of paper, well, that only works with the head, but that still doesn't really work with the emotional intelligence of the heart or the, the gut, uh, the identity and self-protection issues of the gut. So once again, a good embed or good multiple brain integration technique coach will recognize that all three brains are in play. It's important for all three brains to be heard, so all these functions are working together and aligned. And now becomes, how do we actually get all of these to work together for the person so that we get an innate congruence occurring within the person? And, Im and innate wisdom can also start to emerge about their decision. And we'll explain about, about how we go about that in just a moment with, uh, with another framework that we have. Now, there's different other types of things that the, that the three different neural networks can, can, how they interact with each other, what we call constraints. How is it that a client will come to you in a coaching situation and pose a range of different challenges to you? What can happen is one, when one or two of the brains are used to the exclusion of the others, where the heart is just simply doesn't have a voice, or the gut is not being listened to, for, as an example. Or perhaps all three do have a voice, but the head is screaming so loud that it just overrides the other two, overrides one or the others. Or perhaps one intelligence is used inappropriately to do the job of the prime function of the others. This occurs when the heart tries to logic its way into finding out what my passion is in life. Well, the he oh, sorry, when the, when the head tries to logic its way into finding the passion in life. Well, the head's not good at being able to sort out passion. The heart is required to sort out passion. Uh, and again, or maybe the, th the three brains are actually in conflict with each other. Or, as we'll, as we'll talk about uh, a bit later, it's, it could very well be that they're used in the wrong sequence. The order in which the brains are accessed can also make a difference. Now, the map that we use when we're working with in a coaching situation is what we call the MBIT roadmap, or the high-level roadmap. And it basically is, first of all, whenever working with a client, the first thing we want to be able to do is make sure that they get in communication with all three of their brains, all three of their innate intuitive wisdoms. So first of all, teach them to how to actually relax and slow down their sh any stress signals so that they can actually get in touch and listen to what the, heart, what the head is saying, listen to what the heart is saying, listen to what the gut is saying. And then we have processes to get them congruent with each other, how to actually work with them so that the heart, the head, and the gut are all working together so that, they can, so that the client can actually be congruent in the way that they approach a particular issue or, or decision. Then to optimize their function to what we call the highest expressions. And we'll talk about these highest expressions on the next slide. Uh, but basically, for the head brain, it's about being able to, uh, to operate from states of high levels of creativity. For the heart, high levels of, connect, of loving kindness and connection, which we would lovingly call compassion. And for the gut brain, the capacity to have courage to act even against insecurities or conditioning, conditioned responses. And out of this, when this occurs, when all three brains are aligned and working at their highest expressions, 
we found that an emergent wisdom starts to arise, a wisdom that becomes inherent within the person being totally congruent within themselves, a, w a wisdom of response that you could not predict at the start of the session. These highest expressions of creativity, compassion, and courage are absolutely essential for your client to be able to live a life that is truly authentic. It starts with the, it starts with the heart. In terms, we talked about uh, the proper sequence that comes into play. And one of our ambit principles is that the heart leads. And there's a whole range of reasons for this. But for now, because of, of time, uh, we'll just cut to the chase. Uh, it starts with a sense of connection, a compassion for self and then a connection to others as a willingness to serve, a compassion that, that's there to look at the needs of others and to be willing to serve. And then it then engages the head to be able to be creative in, in creative options and approaches of how it responds. It has smart compassion, a way to respond to the world in a way that adds value, that expresses oneself in a way that creates value. And then, this then directs the gut to mobilize and to, via a highest expression of courage, to be able to act despite insecurities that go with conditioning, or sometimes when society says this is not what you should be doing. But if it's true for you, if this is, if this is what your heart really feels, and your head has come up with an intelligent way to do this, then you've got to have the courage to act on your own authenticity, on what's true for you. And this is a major part of the ambit coaching processes. In order to do this, some things you just might want to be aware of. Again, we're not going to go into this in great detail at this point in time, but you do want to know about what's called the autonomic nervous system. There's two arms, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Uh, some, of you, uh, some of our listeners may be already be aware. The sympathetic system is very much responsible for uh, your fight or flight syndrome. It's what activates you. This parasympathetic is the relaxation mode. Ideally, they need to work in balance with each other. And when they are in balance with each other, you get a much more, uh, it's not ex the same as a flow state, but it can lead to a flow state. And so the key is to, re to get autonomic balance. Now, what's, what's fascinating about this is when you're overly stressed, when your client comes to you and they're overly stressed about a particular situation, or they might be overly depressed, too parasympathetic in their mode, it will be very difficult for them to actually harness their intuitive intelligences, their intuitive wisdom, uh, to, with any degree, any, any degree of effectiveness, much less emergent wisdom. The first key is to get them into a state of autonomic balance, which can be measured via the heart. As heart math has shown, it's what's called heart rate variability. And the easiest way to do this is through a, through a process of simple breathing. A uh, great researcher named Stephen Elliott has come up with a very simple process of simply having even, even breathing. Uh, he's found that a rate of roughly about six seconds in and six seconds out allows the person to be able to quickly balance their autonomic nervous system into a state where there's what's called autonomic coherence. So we take clients through a breathing process, then move them up the roadmap so that they can merge their, highs, their highest expressions and gain emergent wisdom. I love this, we love this quote from Stephen Jobs. Uh, Stephen Jobs is, uh, won't read out the entire quote, but what's interesting to you is because you can read it. What's interesting is to look what's inside of this particular quote. And again, he references the difference between the head brain, the heart brain, and the gut brain. And this line that he says on second to last there is that he says they somehow already know, meaning he's already referencing some forms of three intelligences. And again, it references to the emergent authentic way of being, the authentic self that can arise. You already know what you truly want to become. And Stephen Jobs was a great example of someone who can listen to all three of his brains and obviously uh, emerge a, a very congruent way of actually interacting with the world. So in summary, in short, once again, modern neuroscience is proving what ancient wisdom traditions have been saying for two and a half to three and a half thousand years. It's an exciting time because what we're starting to find is with multiple brain integration techniques, we can do tremendous work with clients that before was pretty much either hit or miss or just so highly intuitive it was difficult to replicate. But today we've got a science that shows here's how we can help our clients tap into their innate intuitive wisdoms. It's not airy-fairy. There is a science to it, and we can do it consistently. And so with that, uh, over, back over to you, Ben, for any questions that uh, anyone might have. Wow, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fantastic. You managed to squeezing so much information into the session awesome um and uh, <laughs> just got some of the feedback coming through uh the last few posts been a terrific session wow thank you so much um guys what wh i would love to have some questions come through i know there's lots have been have been asked i'm just gonna um filter through some of these um sessions um there's been so much feedback wow um Okay, a lot of them are specific to some of the things you were talking about. Um, okay, um, 
Are the three neural networks co-located in the brain or in different areas? They are in different. They are literally in the heart and the gut. However, the head there is a, a central accessing point, or I should say, relay channel happening in the head. Um, Grant, you might want to explain a bit more or as quickly about the uh, anterior cingulate cortex at all. Um, yeah, there, there is a couple of regions in the head brain that do uh, what are called maps, um, and they're body maps. They map the visceral components of the, the neural networks of the, the heart and gut regions up into the head. And what's uh, particularly fascinating about these two areas, insular and the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACK for short, is that uh, they are amenable to hypnosis. There's a lot of research that shows that the ACK region can be modified quite strongly with hypnotic languaging. So there's some interesting overlaps there with the sorts of spiritual and esoteric techniques whereby you can communicate to these uh, more primitive regions of your neural networks, the heart and gut, which evolved, for example, the gut brain evolved before the heart or head brain. The gut brain is very primitive and it also develops in the womb first. So these regions are actually located in the gut and heart regions. They grow before the head brain and they have very, very strong impacts at a very deep level on what the head brain can do. Thank you very much for that. Um, very interesting indeed. Um, got a uh, another question here. Let me just quickly grab this up. Um, okay, it says someone's made a comment here. We call the alignment of the three centers of intelligent, authentic leadership. Um, do you have any comments around that? Uh, yeah, we do. We would we would completely agree. One of the things that we find is when the three brains are aligned. Uh, a, a more authentic way of being starts to emerge. Uh, these are changes that are much more technically the words ontological, they're more ontological, the w a way of being starts to arise uh, that is far more authentic. Uh, and when it, in many ways we, we often refer to embit coaches as liberators of the human spirit. Uh, what happens is people come alive when the three brains are aligned and integrated, uh, a sense of authentic self-expression starts to, er to emerge for the person. Uh, and that's why we call when the three brains are not only aligned but uh, but performing uh, at their optimum function, we call these the highest expressions. And what's being expressed is an authentic way of doing oneself. So yeah, we totally agree. Fantastic. Um, question here, Don't, do different cultures use language that refers to other organs, or for example, the liver? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, particularly in Chinese medicine, often they'll refer to the different organs uh, having different forms of intelligence and, and different emoting processes even. Uh, and again, uh, this, this may vary as far as the actual question, the short answer is yes. Um, in, in terms of ambit, again, we've simply, um, we chose to deliberately constrain ourselves to st start with what modern science uh, can actually prove, uh, and then we build our techniques from there. Um, so we're waiting for one day when modern science can prove those types of things, that there are actually intelligences in various organs, uh, However, there, and, and then we'll build it in. But uh, there's certainly a lot of evidence to suggest there is such a thing as a reproductive brain. Uh, some, um, Grant has found some research suggesting that the, the vagus plexi you know, could also be legitimately a brain as well. Um, again, there's not enough ev science evidence to, to, to go with that, so we haven't built it in just yet, but we're, we're very aware of those types of things that are in play. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll just add, just add into that if I can, Ben, that uh, the enteric brain innovates uh, the liver, the spleen, uh, kidneys. Uh, so a lot of the sort of sub-intelligences, uh, we've subsumed that, that uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Taoist philosophy, for example, uh, would speak to very specific sub-intelligences of those organs. We've subsumed them under the gut brain because the gut brain does actually innovate and connect into all those organs and so they're really just you know, in a lot of sense a, a subcomponent um, of the overall computer of the gut brain. Fantastic, thank you very much. Fascinating. This is absolutely fascinating. I, I wish you guys could see the feedback that's coming through. Um, it, it truly is great. Uh, just on that note of feedback, if you are on Facebook, can you jump onto facebook.com slash WBECS? You should have a link in your questions box. Um, just to give us some feedback, um, I know both Grant and Marvin would love to hear from you and see how your experiences with the session were. Uh, please feel free to just jump on there and just 
give your words of wisdom. And if you thought it was a terrible session, please post that on there as well and tag them in those sessions as well. I know nobody's going to have that. But um, one last question, um, a great question here. Um, is there some kind of sequence? So, for example, gut first, then the heart or something like that in which these three brains work for before accepting and making change happen? Absolutely. <laughs> this is the short awesome answer. Question. <laughs> awesome question. Highly intuitive of the, of the first to actually ask that. Yes, we, uh, we've discovered that there is a, a, an organic sequence that seems to work better most of the time than others. Uh, again, specific situations might require a different sequence, but for the majority of the time, uh, we find it's what we call the foundational sequence. It starts with the heart, then it goes to the head. Uh, so the heart goes into a uh, highest expression state, and that then influences what the, the head's thought process is coming from that state of highest expression. Uh, then it goes back to the heart, so the heart values the thoughts that the head has come up with. Then it goes down to the gut, so the gut can start to internalize and act upon those options, and then that goes then back to the heart. So basically the sequence is heart, head, heart, heart, gut, heart. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to call this session to an end for today. Um, I really, really uh, enjoyed the session. It's, it's massively opened up my mind. Um, and I think that's the case for a lot of people um, on, the, on the call today. There's, there's some real wealth of information. You, you ran a really great session there, guys. Thank you so much. That was, that was really hard to do within 30 minutes. Um, I know for your full session um, that we have coming up um, in June um, that you're going to be taking this to the absolute next level. Um, so be sure to to come and join us, uh, everyone who's uh, with us today, um, to enjoy and deepen your learning. Um, so um, without further ado, um, before you go, guys, please um, jump on to facebook.com slash WBECS. Grant and Marvin, are you both on Facebook? I think you are. I know, I know Grant is. Marvin, are you on Facebook as well? Um, not, I, not really, but I can I get through I can get on through the embracing. Okay, so so there you go. So guys, if, if you have any questions, um, you can also ask those on the that didn't get answered. I know there's a ton of questions that didn't get answered. So please continue that conversation over on the, the Facebook page. But uh, thank you so much, everyone. We're seven minutes over, so I'm going to call this session to an end. Um, take care, everyone, and have a wonderful week coming up. Kick some butt. All right, see you later, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Thanks, everyone.